Does that work? Yeah, yeah. This is what works with this okay. to the um, camera. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Chatterton, and I work as Head of Transport Knowledge Management for the ODA, the Olympic Delivery Authority. I'm going to take you through um, transport knowledge management and put it into a bit of context. And there is a bit of a link to some of the presentations you've had already. Um, one of the fields that I'll go into a little bit more depth about is the combination of CAD and GIS, Computer Aided Design and Geospatial Information Systems. Uh, I will take some questions at the end, but we'll see how I'm doing for time. Okay? So, I was going to have some videos, but that didn't quite work out, so I've got some pictures instead. So we'll go for that. Okay. This is a picture from 1906. This is the eruption time of Mount Vesuvius. When Vesuvius erupted in 1906, it killed about 100 people, and it leveled Naples. Now, at the time, Rome was due to stage the next Olympics in 1908. Rome had to then divert all of its funding to the rebuild of Naples. However, the 1908 Olympics still happened. It was actually transferred to London, and it was the first London Olympics. The point I'm trying to make with this is that the Olympics is time critical. It does not move, okay? It's one of the very few projects that you don't even get an hour's grace. The only thing to ever have stopped the modern Olympics is whole-scale worldwide war, okay? That's the only thing that seems to be able to stop the Olympics happening on time. A bit of context for you. Okay, everyone thinks about the Olympics, and the presentations you've seen so far, and probably this afternoon, will focus your attention on the building of a very large park, probably the largest park built in Europe for the last 150 years, and also around the stadium. And these are the iconic things that people think about. The stadium, 80,000 seats of stadium, all these amazing construction items. However, I'm here to tell you that transport's also quite big for the Olympics. I've got some slides on that to make a small point. The budget for transport for the Olympics is around a billion pounds of public investment. There's about 6.5 billion pounds worth of investment in the transport infrastructure in the UK, and mainly London, to allow the Olympics to happen. That's time before the Olympics. During the Olympics, during the operational games time, the ODA will be running two of the largest transport malls in the whole of Europe. There's over 1,000 kilometres of the Olympic route network. And for those who don't know what that is, that is the route of roads around London that allow the athletes and the officials to get to and from their hotels and events on time. If that didn't exist, then they'd be subject to the same rules of the road that we are in London, which would mean you'd travel at four miles an hour and you wouldn't get it anywhere. 800,000 people will be using public transport to get to the Games on the busiest day. That's quite a lot. Bear in mind that London's already got a good 10 million people trying to move, it, move around it all the time. And if any of you have experienced London's transport system, you'll know that it's strained at the best of times. Trips made by spectators during the Games, 20 million. How many tickets are on sale? Olympic and Paralympic Games, 10.8 million. But that's not including the live sites and the general party atmosphere that goes with having an Olympics. Basically, it's the largest party in the world, and the host city hosts that party. And it's not just the people who are going to the events who are part of that party. It's all the residents as well. Now, this is an interesting figure. For the first time, the Olympic Games, 100% of spectators are due to travel to the Olympic Games by public transport. There will be park and ride sites, but there will be no parking for the Olympic Games. You will have to get public transport. OK, so we've been through there. It's time critical. It's big. Also, transport is very complex. And this is a, some picture of a neural network or something. Um, talking about stakeholders, transport officially has 1,000 stakeholders. Not people, organizations that we have to deal with. Of those stakeholders, 200 have a say in our official planning process, OK? It's a very complex beast. So, time critical, big, complex. It's going to be a disaster, obviously. So, let's talk about that a little bit more. Doug Arnott, who's one of the operating guys from LOCOG, who's been involved in probably about 1,000 Olympic Games, is quoted as saying that the key to operational success 
And this echoes some of the points that were made earlier, is the ability to continuously make decisions. On a time-critical project, you can't wait around for decisions. You have to make them. Otherwise, you will miss your deadline. Let's have a think about that. I got up this morning, I had to make a decision. How am I going to get down here? Fortunately, I live just up the road, so it's quite easy. But some of the things I considered before I even got out of bed, I got my phone out and I said, right, what time is it? What time do I need to get up? Because I've got to be there for 8.30 for registration. Missed that. Next, date. I've actually got the time of the meeting right. I'll go and print off the agenda. I'll find out what time this thing's happening. I'll look at what the weather's doing. Is it going to rain? It was raining yesterday. Is it going to rain? Might need to take an umbrella. Do I wear my suit? Do I need a mat? Okay, what are the trains doing? Actually, I didn't need this morning because I was going to walk, but if it was going to be awful, I might have jumped in the car. So these are all pieces of information that you need to make a simple decision. What time am I going to set off? What am I going to wear? Just to come here, okay? You need information and you need it in a timely fashion. However, sometimes you're running late or you've got a critical time you're going to meet. Unfortunately, you might get wet. You've just got to make decisions and go with them. Transport knowledge management, which is the area that I look after, and there's various bits that come under that, but the key mission statement I've tasked my team with is getting people the information they need as and when they need it. That will allow the decision-making process to continue in a timely fashion. So, sounds easy enough. Let's have a think. I was going to show you a video here, but we'll do it in, in uh, just some, some conceptual terms. Take the 100 metres race, okay? So Beijing, 100 metres final. You're looking at that, think of that as a project. It's a very simple project. Got some guys, got to run to the end. First one to the end wins. If we froze that, that race at about nine seconds, and I showed you a clip of it, I can guarantee pretty much all of you would be able to tell me who's in the lead. Usain Bolt went on to win it. Now, take something a bit more complex than 100 metres. Take the Tour de France. Now, firstly, I've no understanding about the rules. Secondly, there's about 1,000 competitors. Thirdly, it's over various stages, and there's a yellow jersey, and there's the team event, and what have you. And I'm sure there's some cycling enthusiasts who will understand that. But if I ask the majority of people here, because it's a very complex thing, if I said at any one point, so say the halfway point during a race, and there's 1,000 riders going past you, who's winning? How would you answer that question? Well, it'd be very difficult, because there's so much complexity it's very difficult to get an information freeze point so you can understand what's going on. And that's the analogy I'm trying to bring about transport with it being big and complex. Because it's so complex, at any one point, it's very difficult to define the information that you're going to need and be able to give an answer to make the important decisions. So, that's a bit of an issue. What can you do about it? Okay, bear with me. First off, you can make a working assumption that people need information to make decisions. I think I've already done that to death, but they do, and you will. Then you can squirrel away and try and find out what information exists around the place. You can make sure you've got good links. We've got these thousand stakeholders. We've put an inordinate amount of effort making sure we understand we, what they are doing and they understand what we are doing. You can make information as widely available as possible. Use things like collaboration sites, use modern technologies, wikis, emails, whatever, to get people up to date. Although you're always chased, uh, faced with security challenges there, which is why I've used that particular image. You give people the tools they need to help themselves. In my area, we've developed a web map browser. It's effectively our own version of Google Maps for transport that allows us and all of our stakeholders to understand what's going on at any one point. And it allows them to pull that information so we can publish it and they can take it down when they need it. I'll show you a little bit more of that later. Also, we need to encourage knowledge sharing behaviours. And I think one of the things you have to accept with a mega project and any major program that's so complex is there isn't going to be one person who knows everything. And in fact, most people are very much specialists in their own area. You have to embrace that and you have to understand that. And you have to accept and be a little bit naive with some subjects that you don't understand and find out who the expert is. But encourage people to be very open about sharing information. However, it's these two next ones that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about. So first off is the reuse of information throughout the project. And I'll come on to that. Information is an asset, and the more you can reuse it, the better. Secondly, 
single source of truth. Where possible, you want to get the information from the horse's mouth. Sorry for the picture. When you've got that information, you need to identify that single source of truth and you make sure everyone else understands that that is the single source of truth. One of the major risks that's come out of previous Olympic Games, because of the complexity, is you end up with various different sources of information. When people can't get hold of information, generally they'll try and build it themselves or they'll make it up, and that causes a considerable risk. So, a little bit more detail here. Let's talk about a single source of truth. Now, if you're looking at a project life cycle, you've got various different stages. I'm not going to go into the detail of this. You're doing an MSc in project management. You probably know all about project life cycle. However, if you think about those different stages, typically they're done by different areas and different contractors and done using different systems and technologies. Concept could be the back of a fag packet drawing. It could be architectural plans. Design might be more detailed CAD type plans. This is where people are getting down to the nitty gritty of the types of nuts and bolts. Then you've got the building and the testing. So you might have finite element analysis coming in there. Then you've got operations and maintenance. How are people actually going to use these buildings? How are you training them? How are you getting them used to using them? And then finally, you've built a product. You may be deciding to market that. So you may be building models, illustrations, pictures. An example of this is we've got a model of the Olympic Village actually sat in our reception area at the moment for the people trying to buy it. And then ideally, you want to feed that into a legacy because all the information that you collect, especially on a project of this size, offers a huge legacy for those organizations that remain. If we just look here. One of the things that we've tried to embrace is instead of having all these different work streams producing their bit, and then saying, right, that's us, we've done the architectural design here, that's us, with that. we've done with the uh, road design for the ORN. We try and get all these pieces of information together. And what that allows us to do is feed them out at various points to other affiliated actions. So things like security, training, safety analysis. The analogy I use is it's kind of like a big bucket. And this used to be very difficult because the worlds of CAD and GIS, which are predominantly the, the areas used for this sort of data manipulation, very different worlds. However, the idea, if you get one big bucket that you can put all this information in and then allow people access to so they can pull the information out in an easy way, then potentially you're going to make some great cost savings because you're not having to reinvent the wheel every time you de develop new systems or ask for information. Also, you've got this big bucket of information available for people. So when they need to make decisions, they can come to one place and make, get the information to help enable them to make those decisions. Catch up my notes. Right, so combining CAD and GIS. Computer-aided drawing and geospatial information systems are typically being two different worlds. I'll give you a practical example of how they can be brought together to actually help you. And the example that I use most of the time is with maps. Now, maps are very important <laughs> for the Olympics. Let's get this right thing. There we go. So, maps serve a basic function. They help produce a conceptual picture in people's minds about reality. And that's always very difficult when you're building something because the reality might not exist yet. So maps allow you to bring that information and put it in people's heads before the actual event. <coughs> maps go from, they've been doing this for hundreds of millions of years or whatever, years and years and years, human history. And you'll find maps all the way along from cave drawings of a pointing to where they found an antelope through to the modern development where you've got things like Google Maps that people use all the time or on their phones. Generally, if people get lost in a city now, they'll just draw up a map. Things have changed very much in the last sort of five or ten years. And people have come to rely on these sorts of technologies on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, just to give you some idea of the sort of geographical coverage of ODA transport, we've got all these areas that we need to get people between at various different times during the games. We understood that a little while ago. And we understood that getting people to understand these different locations was always going to be a bit of a challenge. Get them to conceptually understand what's going on where. And if there's going to be any breakdown or any risks, then it's going to come from people not having a complete picture. So we took a bit of a flyer, actually, and we decided that we were going to invest in a sort of CAD and GIS project. The idea of which to provide us with mapping and the capability to understand what was going on around the world around the place. 
There's issues with that, and I'll, I'll come on to those in a little while, but it's, it's, it's very relevant for this. So, sorts of things that that mapping project allowed us to do was produce foresight around what was being constructed where and how the operations were going to work for the Olympic Games. And these are some of the uh, drawings which show, for instance, how passengers or spectators are expected to get to Olympic Games, say around Weymouth and here. We've got uh, Wimbledon. And some of the complication we've got here is that typically in the GIS world, you'll have nice maps that show you areas and you can do analysis on them and buffers and things like that. And then you've got this big empty patch in the middle, which is the bit that's been constructed or developed. And that's generally done in a sort of CAD environment by technical engineers and drawers. And what you need to do is bring that information together so that people who are making operational decisions can use both of them. So, just a couple of other examples. This is a good one. So, this is the Olympic Park. But this is the Olympic Park during games time. Now, there's very different views of the Olympic Park. There's probably three. There's a legacy look, there's a games time look, and there's the one which is the ads built, which is the thing that you went around yesterday. And that will be developing. And then, as said before, LOCOG will come in and put their overlay on top of it and very much change the look and feel of the park in a way that they need to to get the most out of their sponsors and what have you. By bringing together the CAD and the GIS, we can take the models of, for instance, the stadium and what's going on with bridges and things like that and overlay them with the GIS data, which allows us to look at the entrance points and look at data modeling for the amount of people that are expecting to come in and out of the park at various times during the day. Here's something, again, we put these in the public domain to actually inform our spectators of how we expect them to get to certain events. And by bringing GIS together here and using it in the right way, we can do things. You see the LS in the middle? Well, that's going to be a live site. Now, that data set is actually owned by GLA, Great London Authority, and they've delegated down to produce live sites, which are these areas where you have big TVs like Henman Hill during uh, games time, where people will congregate and watch the events if they haven't got tickets. We need to understand where these things are to be able to put them in context. And because you've got so many different operators and stakeholders involved, by bringing them into one single source of truth, it allows it a, a lot better and clearer view about what's going on. So you can do some sort of collision detection. OK. And then you can produce maps to help people get places. OK. One of the tools that we put in place for our project was the, I said that this sort of Google Maps type interface, and we call it the ODA Map Browser. And there's one of these for the park, and it's very much limited to sort of core samples and people understanding where they can do things on the park. However, there's one of these for the whole of the UK, and we take the, the base data from more than the survey. And what we do is we overlay that with data sets, and we get people to understand throughout all the work they're doing, be it a piece of design work for the Olympic Route Network, be it a piece of environmental sustainability analysis, that actually, if they're creating data and there's a spatial element to that data, can they please bring it into this single source of truth? Because what that allows people to do, so say you're working on a completely different area, you can then look at that data set and overlay it and understand how these things are going to inter interact. And that's going to be one of the big challenges. Here we can show the Olympic Route Network. And you can break it down into its sections. And this is sort of a GIS environment. However, with the tool that we've developed, you can actually go into that and actually look at the detailed CAD plan and the one I'm showing there is actually a PDF, but you can go open up the actual CAD plan and go down to the nuts and bolts detail, which is really giving the power to people to have the information they need to make those decisions. Okay, so, sounds like a good idea. What are the challenges? Well, the major challenge with combining CAD and GIS is that typically in projects, there's been this GIS world and there's been this CAD world. And there's a major investment to get people to move to this next level of technology. And unfortunately, the business case doesn't really exist at the moment. We went to various different partners, so we talked to Esri, Autodesk, MicroStation, about the types of technology, and none of them had a really mature offering. In the end, we all ended using uh, Autodesk as a solution. And even now, there's still bugs with this in terms of how it uses uh, the data and how it works together. However, there's huge benefits to that. But the problem that you guys will face is that this stuff's really useful. Actually, in any size of project, this is useful. You can probably do a lot of the things that we're doing now on Google Maps or with some sort of mashups yourselves when you approach a big program or project. However, there is some investment in both time, energy, maybe technology to get that to work. 
And at the moment, there's no quantifiable business case for the value that that delivers. Now, if you take my root diagram, the pink one that was going up, I showed that. It's a very simple concept, that you take all this data and design work that's being fed into the bucket, well, you just do it once, and then you reuse it. However, the value that feeds out of that, as opposed to redoing design every time, so the guy who's producing the CGI model to sell the place, is he going to redesign the whole model himself, or can he just pull the CAD data straight from the design drawings, which is a possibility these days? Unfortunately, that business case doesn't exist. So when you're looking forward to your projects or programs, and you're faced with this challenge, and you want to understand and make this big complex thing conceptually understandable, how are you going to convince the funders and the powers that be that it's a worthwhile investment of money? And that's something that I think is just a challenge for the industry at the moment. Technically, I don't know if it hands up anyone who's interested in the technical bits. No? Didn't think so. <laughs> Down here. Okay. Technically, okay, um, here's a diagram put together by my data manager. It kind of shows how things are set up. We use a SharePoint environment for managing the jobs. It's kind of, I refer to it as kind of like the ticketing system. You get in Argos, you take a ticket, and you, you get your number, and someone will produce a map for you or look after your data. Our system's built around an Oracle 10G spatial database. Very exciting stuff. That basically, in layman's terms, can take any sort of spatial data. That is then pulled from, written, written to and read from, by both Topperbase, which is the, it's an extension of 3D map for uh, Autodesk, which is the CAD-based tool, so CAD reaching towards GIS. And also we use an ArcGIS server, which allows Esri to interact as well. And they go through a version control and metadata tool to make sure we meet with all the standards for metadata. To the side of that, you've got FME, which is what my uh, data manager talks about all the time. Because basically, that is an engine. It's some piece of software. It looks very technical. It comes up with workspaces and things. But that is the engine that allows me to walk into any meeting. And whenever I meet a stakeholder and they say, well, we've got this data. Do you want it? I say, well, yes, it would be useful if we brought that into the single source of truth for these things. They say, what format do we have to put it in? With that engine, I'm allowed to say anything. If you can produce it, my data manager can use that tool to bring it into the Oracle Spatial Database. OK? So that's very useful. And then you have loaders, and then at the top, you've got the ability for normal users, you and me, the people who aren't GIS or CAD experts, to interpret that data. And that's that kind of Google Maps type web mapping interface. And we can customize that. It doesn't look brilliant at the moment. We can spend more time and energy on making it look good. But the key thing is giving people access to data sets that may not necessarily be in their core line of work, so they can understand the whole picture. So that's the technicals. So, what do you need to know? What's the other complexity? Well, the other challenge we've faced is not the gents' toilet, it's people. You're bringing together different worlds here. We're at a very interesting time. Traditionally, you've had GIS people, environmental background or geography background. They're good with scales. They're good at understanding how big things are and how they work together in the interaction. They're good at bringing together different data types and pulling together pulling existing data into their programs. And they're good with shapes and metadata, assigning tags to things and objects, getting them a virtual piece of metadata, metadata being information about information. OK. Although they do struggle with version control, is something I've found about GIS people. And also, graphical representation is not always considered. They will throw three or four different data sets on the screen and go, brilliant, can't you see all the collisions? And the layman will just look at it and say, well, Actually, you're not making this very easy for me. The other world you've got is CAD, computer aided design. Generally from an engineering background, very good at high detailed skill levels, looking at the nuts and bolts, getting things accurate, lengths and measurements. They're also very good in 3D, a good understanding. And their version control is generally impeccable because they've been drilled into them from a very early age of their careers that version control is key to CAD drawings. Not so with GIS, but pros and cons. There are some restrictions in the mentality of CAD people, though. They focus on their world. They've got this sheet of paper or this virtual workspace in front of them, and that's their world. They're not really that interested in what's going on next door or what's going on underneath or what's going on behind it. They've been asked to draw this object, and that's what they're going to focus on, by, thank you very much. Whereas the GIS people look at the spatial reality of the, of the 
area that that object is set in and say, well, you've got, a, you've got something going on here, you've got a waterway, you've got a utility. CAD people generally are given a task and they focus on it. They also struggle a little bit with the larger scales because CAD is generally not used above certain size of objects. And the other thing is they fail to complete polygons, which may sound innocuous, but a CAD person will draw a square and they won't connect the end bit, which actually causes GIS people all sorts of problems because what they want is a square, not three, four lines that aren't connected. So that's a bit of a challenge. I've added another one in here because uh, on the, something the size of the Olympics, we've had int introduced another element, and this is about cartography and graphic design. And this is about getting the output of the things that are developed into a way that people can understand it. And it's very important, depending on how much you can afford, it's definitely something I'd advocate. These sorts of people are very good at graphical outputs, turning, using communication techniques to turn the virtual into the real and let people understand, fading away things that are unimportant, bringing to the foresight the things that you really need to know about, interpreting reality. They're great at that but they have little or no understanding of data and what it's about. They just see pictures. They have little or no controls, because once something moves into a sort of drawing space, say Illustrator for creating a map, if they move something, that then can fail to move back in the database, which means that you could lose some version control. And it's very much style over substance. So, bringing those things together, CAD, GIS, cartography and graphic design, is spatial data management. And I'd say if there's one major lesson that I've learned that I'd impart to you guys is if you're going to go down this path of bringing CAD and GIS worlds together for the big bucket of information, the most important person is your spatial data manager. Because that is the person that sits on top of that spatial database and makes sure that everything going in and going out is correct and accurate and everything's version controlled and works in the right way. They're generally very techy. They actually like these very detailed programs that you look at and it just looks like the matrix in front of you. They're quite happy in that world. But generally, they've got a good understanding of how people use the data. And what I say to you guys is that if you go down this route, take very good care of your spatial data manager. OK. So, summing up a little bit. Our lessons learned. Having a single source of truth is very valuable. Wouldn't it be great if we could get a business case sorted out for that? And I think that's a challenge that I'm going to push forward at a few conferences this year. Reuse data throughout the project where possible. Get people thinking outside of their silos of design and construction and O&M. Think at a higher level that data is something that everyone needs and can use for a successful project. We found that the worlds of CAD and GIS can uh, coexist, despite them being very different characters. But data management is the key to that. So, in summary, time-critical projects need timely information to make decisions and succeed. Okay? A single source of truth for CAD and GIS data can make access to information quicker, easier, and less expensive. I know that's a fact. I'm yet to formally prove it in the business case. I think this is something that we will be doing in the future. And lastly, to you, the people of the future who are going to be looking at program management of huge programs, think of all the data with a place, i.e. a location, as one of your assets. And allow others within the program and your close stakeholders to maximize the value of that, access, of that asset through access. Okay. That's me done. Any questions? Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Good. I'm David Birch, I'm Head of uh, Programme Controls for CLM um, and uh, I joined the programme about three years ago uh, in May of 2008. Uh, it was talking about change, it was a big change in my life. Um, one minute I was talking to the uh, NDA, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority up in Sellafield about a, a huge contract to manage that site. Uh, and uh, I get a phone call saying, would you like to come and work on the Olympics? Uh, well, I'm here today, so I, I made that decision, and I've, not, uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it since. So this morning, I'm going to take you through our approach to setting the baseline and change control and contingency management. Um, very much entwined with what uh, Russell was uh, talking to us about earlier on in the morning about risk. 
This is all about the management of the risk